Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Belfort family. Blessings to you and uh, much love and ongoing blessings to Eric and Candace. I'm just so thankful. This is uh, more challenging than you, you may be able to imagine, but uh, um, we're going to do well. Um, I want you to notice the picture behind me. Isn't it beautiful? All those orange trees are evergreens. So either they were photoshopped or they're dying. Actually, either they're photoshopped or they're dead. It's beautiful color contrast. All the dark green trees in the middle, those are actually the kind that turn orange. But they are green. I just thought it would help me to communicate that to you because it's so important. Uh, all right, help me out here. Open your Bibles. That's, that's, uh, helps me. Just trust me. Work with me here. Open your Bibles, if you would, <clears throat> to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. We will, um, as has probably been said well enough already, I, I, I think, we are not going to be quick to be making plans. We want to savor the moment in a sense because we want to make sure that we give honor where it's due and express our, our absolute thanks and, and uh, gratefulness and celebration for uh, who Eric and Candace are and all that they've done. And so this will be a very tender season. We will be uh, uh, very open and upfront with you about what's going on and when, but we're going we're gonna to be carefully communicating this next season uh, for you. Um, this is, uh, I, I don't, for me, there's not been a weirder season in my life. Um, the, the most challenging in many ways, and to be honest with you, the pandemic has nothing to do with it. It just is kind of a nuisance. And forgive me, I know it's more than a nuisance to so many that have suffered so deeply. Um, but uh, for my own personal experience, it's not been the cause of the most challenging season. Uh, instead, it is just there as a, a constant reminder that's a, it's, a, it's a strange thing. The political climate of the nation is going to settle here soon, but uh, we got that swirling, and now we've got our own world. And it's like the perfect storm in which Jesus himself will show up and only he will get glory. Uh, it's not going to be through gifting, through wisdom. None of, nowhere that we have succeeded has it been because anybody was smart or unusually anointed. It's just absolutely the grace of God. The grace of God, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. I, I've actually had this chapter on my mind for months, and um, so I, I'm, I'm going to talk to you out of Jeremiah chapter 29, and um, try to uh, reaffirm uh, a phrase that's been used a lot. Uh, Benny, I, uh, I think she started it for us several years ago, God's got this. Others have picked it up, and there's T-shirts, and there's mugs, and all kinds of paraphernalia to remind us that God's got this. And, um, but here's what I, I want to do. We're going to read the verse that probably most of you know by heart, or many of you would know by heart and would be able to quote, and that's verse 11. I want to read that, but then we're going to go back and look at the context. I do want to give you a, a brief but... Um, uh, important uh, teaching or decree about this season uh, that we're in. Verse 11 is uh, the verse that uh, most people know. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. I want you to look at it again. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. And that verse is such a broad-reaching promise of the Lord. It's quoted often by, you know, preachers that I hear through the years, and rightfully so. It's just one of those, it's one of those gems that's just tucked away in a very uh, difficult setting. And, uh, and I'm so thankful for this decree that the Lord makes. I know the thoughts that I think about you. They're not thoughts for your calamity. They're for your blessing. They're for your welfare. Interestingly, this word peace 
in this passage is uh, also translated prosperity. It's pr- translated health. It's just overall well-being. And it is, the, it is what is on the mind of God about us in the middle of this situation that we're in. And we can describe it through the political climate of the country. We can do it through the pandemic. We can do it just in the Bethel world with, uh, with a very, uh, for me, extremely sad uh, departure and transition change. Uh, we can look at a lot of different things. Some of you in your own personal lives have things completely unrelated to anything that I have mentioned going on in your own life, in your own home. It may be a business that is, uh, is, just, is just dying. It may be other things. So th- the point is, we're going to read a context here that I think long term can give us a wonderful, wonderful hope. And for me, if, if you know anything about how I function in my life, whenever something comes up, I run. I don't walk. I run to the promises of the Lord. I run to what has God spoken to me? What has he said to me last? What is it that he has deposited in my heart about this season? Most people could, you, you would do well if you just returned to the last thing God told you. But sometimes because of anxiety and fear and all the junk that goes on in our lives, we, we tend to drop the things that God has given us. And, uh, and we can't afford to do that right now. We've got too many things swirling. And I, I'm going to ask you, as I mentioned in this video, we, we've got to return to the strongest absolutes in our life. And that is this right here. I know the thoughts I have towards you. It's thoughts of a father, a perfect father. A perfect father who is wonderfully good. And it was that one theme, that one thought that brought Jesus to earth to take on flesh, to take on the cross, and to raise again. Everything that he did was to reveal the father. And so this is not a side issue. This is the core issue. It's all about the fatherhood of God in your life and in mine. And right now, I'm in a place where I'm going to emphasize being a son, a child, not the leader. That never stops. But hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Right now is where I take that hat off. I'll put it down. And I'm I'm wearing the hat of a a child that, that really needs the father. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to read about 10 verses, so hang in there. I'm going to make uh, three kind of concluding thoughts, and then we'll wrap this, uh, this day up together. We're going to start with verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Stop right there. Please notice this wonderful promise where God says, I know the thoughts I have towards you, was towards a group of people that were in captivity, they were held prisoner in another nation. Build houses, verse 5, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may increase there and not diminish. So that the, the word of the Lord was, you're in captivity, but if you'll do this my way, you'll thrive there. Okay. You'll thrive there. What, what you think is destroying your life is actually going to be the platform for your greatest promotion. And so we've, we've got to repent and shift, change the way we think and perceive situations. That you may be increased there and not diminished. Verse 7. And seek the peace of the city. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible because it, I'll never forget when it hit me, oh goodness, 30, 35 years ago in Weaverville when we, we began to focus on the prayer for the benefit of our city and not thinking it's us and them. And this word peace, this is one of the places, I think it's in the New American Standard where it says, seek for the prosperity of the city. So let me read it with that word prosperity, verse 7. Seek the prosperity of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace or in its prosperity, you will have prosperity. There's something profound about this. In fact, if you're writing notes down, write down 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, 
because in that passage is a directive in prayer that was to bring the people of God into the abundance of peace and impact on culture itself. It's the most unusual parallel between this chapter and that one. All right? So for, uh, for in its peace you will have peace. Verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets or your diviners who are in your midst deceive you. Here's an interesting phrase. Nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. It's a profound lesson by itself. I believe very much that the Lord speaks to us through dreams. I have, I've had so many critical times in my life where the Lord has has, has inspired a dream that's given me insight of what to do, things I didn't know what to do, and I woke up understanding because of a dream. I've had the Lord affirm me in dreams, very unusual, unusually. <clears throat> but when we hold to our agenda and there's an unwillingness to yield to the purposes of God, that bent or that desire in us will actually create its own dream in the night. It will actually cause there to be a dream that appears to be a prophetic dream when in fact it's not from the Lord at all. It's the offspring of your own unyielded desires. I believe strongly in the dream life. And the Lord speaks all through scripture and in my own experience. But just understand walking with a yielded heart to the purposes of the Lord. Song of Solomon, though I sleep, yet my heart is awake. That posture positions us to have divine dreams. All right, look at it again. The last part of verse 8. Nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I've not sent them, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, says the Lord. Look at verse 13 again and we'll we'll wrap uh, the reading up with this. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. It's interesting, Jesus used a very similar um, uh, language in the Gospel of John where he said, he said, I will be found by you. And he uses a word that says, I will make myself conspicuous. In other words, you're going to be going down the road looking and I'm going to jump in the middle of your path and do something like this so that you can't miss me. And we have that kind of a father who wants to be known and discovered by his own. And every person watching this, whether you're part of the Bethel family or tribe, and and this uh, news uh, this morning is devastating to you as it is to me, uh, it rattles us deeply, or you're a guest and you're watching and, and, uh, and you don't have quite the history to feel some of what we're feeling. Regardless of what position you're in, the Lord makes a covenantal promise to you. And he says, if you search for me with all your heart, you'll find me. I will make sure that I'm in the middle of whatever road you're walking down, and you will discover me. There will be that encounter that changes everything. Our life as disciples of Jesus, our our life as followers of the Lord is hinged upon us encountering him. It's not peripheral. It's not an addition to. It is life. His voice brings us life. We live because he talks. This word is the living word of God. He speaks in it and through it and he enhances and adds strength and life to us to carry out his purposes. But this story, this great grand promise that God gives. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, the thoughts I have for you. They're thoughts of your welfare, not your calamity. They, uh, to give you a future, to give you a hope, that pristine promise 
came at the most unexpected and awkward time. And it's the mercy of the Lord that regardless of whatever hell hole you think you're in right now, whatever the situation might be, if you'll calm your heart just a bit, turn to the Word of God, God will speak to you and bring a promise that is so opposite to your surroundings that it will shock you, it will stun you. Imagine being carried away captive, not willingly, unwillingly, bound, taken to another nation. You are now subservient to this ruling class of people. You are prisoners there. And the Lord comes to you and all you can see is the restrictions, the restraints, the problems. You, all you remember is what you left behind, what you lost, how it could have been, the promises you had over your life and they didn't come to pass. You got all this stuff swirling around you and the Lord steps into the middle of that absolute chaos and he says, I want you to know what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking really good thoughts about you and it's about your, it's about your welfare. It's actually about your prosperity. I've got a lot of plans. I, I daydream about you, and I think about these moments that are so difficult for you, but if you'll take just a moment, you'll rediscover the promise of the Lord. And I remind you of that psalm that is so uh, important to all of us, the 23rd Psalm. He says, I prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Think through that. I prepare a table. What's the table? The table is a place of exchange. The table is a place of fellowship. The table is a place to eat. It's a place of nourishment and strengthening. So the Lord says, I prepare this place of personal strength and personal encounter in the midst of your enemies. And oftentimes we're overly mindful of what's not right. And we've lost sight of the very fact that the Lord put a table right in the middle of the most unexpected place. And we find it again in Jeremiah 29. I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Their thoughts of your, of your blessing, of your, your prosperity. I'm going to bring you into wholeness. I'm going, to, I'm going to bring you into why you're on the planet in the first place. You'll not miss a thing. I'm bringing you back. And then he says, be careful. Don't listen to those who, 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 uh, who announce to you that, uh, uh, that God is not in this. He has arranged this. And I don't care. It, 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 uh, he's not the God of calamity. Uh, he's not the God who creates viruses and all this junk that's going on. But I tell you what, he is still God in the midst of it. And what's important for us is to not fight. It's going to sound awkward. Don't fight the restraints, the restrictions. Uh, uh, masks, pandemic. Ugh. We're going to have a mask burning party someday. But until then, there are some of you that believe it's the absolute key to remaining healthy as, as a, as a uh, community. Fine. Promote it in the spirit of Christ. Do your best to hold up that standard, and I will support you. There are others of you that believe that it is from the pit of hell, and you will have nothing to do with it. Fine. Just do so in the spirit of Christ. The, the point is, is we've got to hold to what we're doing, realizing we are a diverse family. We never require you to think this way. What I want you to do is I want you to learn how to think, how to respond. Not give you our pre prescription on how to, you know, make it through this pandemic. That's not important to me. I, I know the Lord has convictions about stuff, but sometimes there are some issues that we face in our life. I don't, the devil doesn't care what your opinion is as long as you leave the spirit of Christ to promote it. If you sacrifice this so that you, you promote, I don't care what noble cause you have. I watch, I watch right now. It's at a heightened level in our nation where people leave and forsake the spirit of Christ to promote their agenda. And I'll tell you what, it is that drive in here to promote an agenda apart from the, the Spirit of Christ that actually creates in us the capacity to dream things that are not from God. So look at these verses. Number one, we're in a situation we can't get out of. You, you pick, pick whatever one you want. <clears throat> I feel like I'm holding up a deck of cards. Just pick a card, any card. We've, we've got enough things going on right now. Just pick one. I, I don't care what your favorite or your least favorite is. Just pick one. 
We're not in a position to change it. What are we in a position to do? We are in a position in the middle of whatever crisis you may be facing to find the word of the Lord. You're responsible for it. I've told you before in these, what I don't know how many hundreds of years it's been since we've met together. <laughs> but I've mentioned before, if, if you have more input from social media, from mainstream media, than you do the Word of God, then your discouragement is self-inflicted. You're responsible. You cannot have a garden and have a key to the gate and invite the enemy to come in and plant weeds and then moan to God about it. You've got to repent for the fact you've entertained things that are in conflict with the will and purposes of God. We've got to take ownership of this, the, the gate, if you will, to our own hearts, the gate, if you will, to, to our own assignment here in life as we guard well what God has said. So number one, stop fighting the restriction. Learn how to flourish in it. Amen, Bill. I think you're on to something. Number one, stop trying to fight where God put you. Number two, be restored to the promise of the Lord. Rediscover for yourself, not just something you can quote flippantly, but I mean the heart-to-heart -heart connection with the Father who honestly looks for your welfare. He fights for your welfare. He contends for your blessing, not your calamity. Be restored to that face-to-face, -face, that mouth-to-mouth -mouth connection with the Father who says, this is how my heart burns for you. My imagination runs wild of the things that I want to do for you. Get, get back to that one, the Father. And then the last one. Is set your heart to seek the face of the Lord. These are all things that are normal parts of the Christian life. But I feel like in this moment, it would be critical for us to review and to renew. It's kind of like when the Lord spoke in <clears throat> Revelation to the church at Ephesus. He corrected them, he rebuked them because they had uh, lost their first love. But what was his prescription that he wrote out for them? He says, do the deeds you did at first. Be restored to what you used to do. And I, I'm coming to you right now, not with the first love message, but with just the overall message right now, right now. Stop trying to fight a setting or a situation that you're in where God has placed you. And you have to discern that one. But where God has placed you. Stop trying to fight it. Number two, instead of focusing on what isn't going right, that enemy that surrounds you, because he will, he, uh, we all know from experience, he torments us, torments us by attacking us in our thought realm. Instead of being that where we anchor our souls and our thought life, this is where we deliberately return to the promise of the Lord, the table of the Lord, and have the face-to-face -face fellowship with the King of Kings, our Father. And we get restored to that place of confidence. God, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know what's going on. I don't know the answer. There's so many things I wish I would have done differently. And I'm, I tell you, I'm speaking out of experience. So many things I wish I would have done differently. But I'm here. And I'm still in your mind. I'm still in your heart. And your intentions for me have never changed. They are nothing but the best. Even when I feel so unqualified, so undeserving for your best. And yet you've set it aside for me. So Father, I sit and I, I return to that table where I refuse to be distracted by the circumstances of my life. And I choose to be occupied with the face of the one who brought me to the table. Stop fighting the restriction. Rediscover the table and set your heart 
to seek the face of the Lord because he's given us a promise. I will be found by you. I will be found by you. It is impossible to hunger after the Lord and not discover him. It is the covenantal promise of the one who is more perfect than the rising of the sun tomorrow morning. It is more dependable than the rising of the sun in the morning. He is that kind of a father. Now I realize that there are some watching this this service who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You know what? Put everything else, everything that we've said, put it aside. This is what's important. Is that Jesus suffered and died with you in mind. He actually wanted to make it possible for you to know what eternal life is. And we've got people on the YouTube channel and the Bethel TV and podcasts and other, other forms of broadcasting that are available to talk and pray with you. I, I want you just to put it on there and just say, I, I want to know Jesus. I want to know what it is to be forgiven. I want to know what it is to be born again. I want to, I commit my life to follow this Jesus. Let me pray for you, and then uh, we're going to wrap this up, and I'll turn it over to our team that will close the service. So, Father, we just... <laughs> We just put on the child's hat and take off all the other significant hats and important hats and responsibility and position and title and all the other stuff. And we just, we just say, Father, here we are. We're, we're kids. We don't know what we're doing. But we sure do love you and we sure do trust you. And so we just turn our hearts to you. We say, Father, we trust you. Father, we love you. And we ask, be glorified right now in our lives together. This global family, the local Bethley family, Father, be glorified in the individual members with Eric and Candace, with us who remain here in this place. Most of all, Father, be glorified. I ask this in the honor of the name Jesus. Amen.